next one, of course, uh, again about power series. This time, comparing such a power series with the famous geometric series, uh, which you remember from the first semester, uh, to be one of the well, one of the most famous um, converging series under certain uh, conditions. Uh, I'm talking about the, of course, the, the geometric series uh, of, of constant numbers. Um, but now it's interesting that we will be able to use it in order to construct uh, a valid power series for a given analytical function. Now let's, let's just look what we have. Uh, this function is given, it's one over um, the quantity one minus x to the power of three. So this seems to be quite a rather simple rational function. Uh, we look at it at x equals zero. And then the idea is starting using the geometric series, interestingly, but now this is just a hint for you, using instead of the, the usual symbol q uh, for the base, in the, in the geometric series, we replace it by x. So we make it variable. Uh, but you must um, be careful. Uh, it's more in the sense of uh, renaming it in the, in, in the sense of a parameter, which is constant, but can be changed as, <laughs> you know what, what I mean? Um, you, can, uh, you can look at a certain value of x and then um, examine the whole expression, and then you can change this value of x and examine it again. That's, that's in, in the sense of a parameter. But anyway, we will see how it goes. Then, which is the convergence interval of the corresponding power series? But how do we get a power series for this function using the geometric series? Now, let's remember, here it is. This is the geometric series. What does it do? Uh, or what does it contain? It contains the summation of, a uh, complete summation of the powers of, of a given constant Q. So like, very simple. Q power n, uh, the whole thing summed up from n equals zero up to infinity in, <laughs> in principle, okay? Um, when I say up to infinity, I always mean um, infinity by mind, not, not actual infinity, of course. Um, so what is it? Uh, starting with the neutral exponent, zero, like Q to the power of zero is always one. As long as q is unequal or is great is greater than zero that's that's you no know, not even it's unequal to zero but even zero to the power of zero is equal to one as you may remember this is this can be proved um so it, it's it's a fact it's one neutral now goes on plus q plus q squared plus q cubed plus q power four and so on um now this is well known but the interesting point is that there is an explicit formula for the convergence value of this geometric series, if it converges, you know? So that means um, limit n approaching infinity of this expression equals, very interesting, one over one minus q. There's a very famous example uh, taking q equals one half, which you may know um, there are many anecdotes about it, like the Tower of Babel, um, the story of um, some, some kind of, of run, run race. Um, don't ask me how it's called. Um, there are many anecdotes, but uh, anyway, it converges. And let's take this example. If Q equals one half, and we insert here, we have one over one minus one half, which is one over one half, and then equal to two. So two is actually, it means that just for the newcomers also, if you would ask yourself what might be the limit of one plus one half plus one fourth plus one eighth uh, plus one over 16 and so on, because that's what it is. If you see, if you look here, the powers, the powers of one half in this case, if Q equals one half are these. And then it's quite easy in, in different ways um, to convince yourselves that this must be convergent. And it, because what you add as next is, is always half, the next element that you add is exactly half as, as large um, as, as the previous one. 
And that's why you never fill more than two holes, uh, holes in, in the sense of whole number. Okay, so it approaches two, that's its limit. You can easily um, prove this even graphically. And, and, and well, this is everything um, was performed in the first semester. I just wanted to uh, remember you. And now, to remind you of this. Um, okay, then um, taking this for granted, um, this holds if Q is inside the interval negative one and one. So that's, that's also part of that proof, okay? So that we can take it for granted. Then it's convergent. Now, changing or replacing Q by X, it's, it's interestingly, and, and let, let me just call it G of X. Like this is called F of X, so just to, not to mix it up. I construct a function G of X in the form of a power series that you could say this is the simplest power series uh, you, you can imagine. Why? Because the coefficient series is the so-called one sequence. Uh, uh, sorry, the, um, the coefficient sequence is the so-called one series. It's the series consisting only of factors of one. So there's just these uh, powers of x summed up. That's, uh, that doesn't seem very convergent at first, but now, uh, interestingly, if x is a number uh, which, which has an absolute value lower than one, then actually these um, powers of x get smaller and smaller every time. And then if you sum up, you, you find something which converges. That's interesting by itself now. Um, but then, since this is the identical expression as this one, just replacing q by x, then if, um, if it converges, it must converge to this expression, 1 over 1 minus x. And now, after demanding that x is inside minus 1 and 1, uh, we say we choose any value of x and we have convergence to that term, to this expression, it means, in the end, it means that this power series is a representation of this function for all values of x which lie inside uh, this convergence interval, replacing q by x here. That's, that, that's the trick, okay? And then what do we do? We differentiate this. Here it says differentiating, and then I must tell you that it is allowed by proof um, to differentiate also an infinite series term by term. By the way, the same, uh, there's an analogy to, to the optional exercise, 7.1 number five, I think, the last one, uh, where you can, where you are asked to perform integration term by term, which is also possible, much the same way. Now, let's differentiate it on, in, in two different ways. Firstly, uh, term by term, so if I take this and I see, okay, all these are simple, um, you, you, could, you could say power functions. Each, each of these terms is a simple power function. And we know this is one of the most famous differentiation rules, of course, differentiate, differentiating or yeah, differentiating a, a power term um, leads to uh, the fact, well, the, the scheme is you take the exponent as a factor in, and then you reduce the exponent by one, right? So you get n times x over, uh, sorry, x power n minus one. So that's, uh, but then one important point, we sum up starting from zero. And we must not forget, look here, there's a constant of one um, representing this, uh, the, yeah, the, the element number zero, right? You know what I mean? So what we have here is actually equal to one plus x plus x squared and so on, of course, yeah? So now what would happen if you differentiate it by hand? You would see that this constant here, this additive constant disappears after differentiation. The x changes to one, the x squared changes to two times x and so on. So all, all these elements, um, uh, stay alive uh, except for this one. This just disappears. And that's important to know because it means if I do this in closed form, I must move my starting value zero to one. If I didn't do that, I would, uh, I would state that a constant might be differentiated by the scheme which I'm using here, but it doesn't. 
or if you do it, well, you, you, you already have x to the power of zero, and then zero times x power of negative one is, is just plain false. But okay, perhaps it would work by the factor of zero, but don't do it, okay? Uh, that's all I wanted to, to tell you. Um, then let's look here. I hope you understand this. It's important to move um, to change from n equals zero to n equals one so that the, the, the zero element disappears. Now that's what we get. And now also, if this is valid, it must represent the function, uh, which is the derivative of this one. That's the interesting point. We, we perform a, a term by term differentiation here, but then we we'll also um, perform a direct differentiation of this functional term since we have shown that this power zero represents exactly this function. So this is by a theorem, this is also uh, valid. This is allowed and, and this is correct, okay? So um, what is this? It's uh, the inverse or the reciprocal of one minus X. So I can write it in this form. One minus X in parentheses, power negative one. Differentiating by taking the exponent as a factor. So then I get, I would get if I differentiate it, right? I would get negative one times this expression, sorry, uh, power negative two. And then I go back to, to the fraction notation and it's like negative one over this expression squared. So now, oh, you see, uh, I forgot something. Be since this expression inside um, must be also must also be differentiated. Uh, uh, the whole expression is, or the whole expression must be differentiated using the chain rule. And I just forgot it. The chain rule says that the inner derivative must be taken as a factor. But since here, the derivative inside is zero for the constant, which disappears, and then negative one for this. So I get a negative one factor additionally, and this cancels out. Uh, or I mean, what I wanted to say is um, negative one times negative one gets positive one. Okay, so that's <laughs> that's the reason why it's written one over the quantity one minus x squared in this way as a derivative of this function. So that's the step, the first step. And then you might now looking here, <laughs> you might guess what's next. We must do this again. We take the second derivative of g of x. This time we even have to start n with n equals two for the same reason, because you know that the n equals one term here uh, is nothing else than one times x power zero. So it's a constant one again. As I told you, uh, I must show you again. If this is the original um, series, right? Uh, and then I differentiate it. Let's do it this way. I get, this disappears. This gets one and then plus two X plus three X and so on. And then you see this one is now uh, what we denote with N equals one here. And this disappears again if I if I uh, take the next derivative, okay? That's that's the point, the crucial point. Um, and that's oh, that's why, I, uh, you can check it, okay? I have to say n equals two um, upward, no? From n equals two approaching infinity, up to infinity. Uh, so, but again, I can use this differentiation rule, which says that the exponent gets um, used as a factor here, n minus one times n from here, and then x power n minus two. Uh, interesting product of uh, two successive uh, natural numbers, sort of like a faculty, uh, and then equals now, but if I take the derivative again of this one, I don't put it in this form, you, you make it um, yourselves or you, you check it yourself, right? So because this is parenthesis power negative two, and then I get negative two as a factor, but then I must again use the chain rule, it gets positive again. Um, in the end, I get um, a factor of two in the numerator. Also, I get this expression to the power of three in the denominator, that's, that's it. So that means having found this expression, this is, must be equal as a series representing 
uh, uh, this function, it must be equal to this function two um, over one minus x uh, power three. And since our f of x function is this one, we must divide this whole equation by two, and then we have found our final power series representing this function. You see what I'm doing? I'm dividing every single element of this series by two. So I put just put a factor of one half here inside. Interesting, we can just look at the first few elements one half times, and then I get, please note, it, it starts with n equals two, two times one, actually, this number times pre predecessor number. Um, so one half times two is one, and, and then x to the power of zero, so that, that's the constant again, which is again one equal to one. Interesting because all these functions, just to, uh, check it, all these functions have the, pro uh, the property that they are equal to one at the starting point. At the, when, uh, if you insert x equals zero, you get one over one, right? So that must be one also in the series, in the power series. Now, that's a good, good um, let's say, a, a sort of a verification um, that we're doing the right thing. Now, next element, one half times two, no, the next is for n equals three. So one half times three times two, one half times six is three. And the next one gets here for, you know, four times three is 12 um, and half of it is equals to six. And then the 10 and then 15. And now uh, it, it has a, a little similarity to the to one of the, the series we saw before, but it's different. It's like, um, mm, it even reminds me a little bit of Fibonacci numbers, but uh, it's not even those. Um, well, it's interesting. Uh, you could. This is the scheme for it. So that's the, even that's already the result of our exercise. Yeah. But now, uh, just that you can see, it's interesting. And actually, it also converges inside the same interval as the original function. That's also part of that theorem I had been using by, uh, when I said we are allowed to differentiate term by term. Um, 